Good morning, good morning. We want to welcome you to Word of Life Fellowship. We're going to get started with our service this morning. I ask that all that are here, if you would please stand, Father, uh, stand. We're all going to uh, go before the throne of grace with prayer. To begin, all hearts and minds are clear. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just come to you giving you thanks this morning. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be here, Lord. We thank you for waking us up this morning, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the breath in our body, Father God, and the activity of our limbs, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just come here and we stand together, Father God, in the name of Jesus, to, um, to give you thanks. Lord, but we also offer a petition of prayer for our bishop and our pastor, Father God, and the, and the leaders of this house, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just ask you to be with them today, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask that you just breathe a breath of life into Bishop right now, Father God, as he prepares to play the saxophone and preach the word that you've given him, Father God, in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, we just ask you to allow the Holy Spirit to just be, just be with him, Father God, in the name of Jesus, and keep your angels around him, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just ask that you just allow your Holy Spirit to stand guard at the door, Father God, in the name of Jesus. And every person that enters into this building, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just ask you to just allow your angels to just surround them, Father God, your Holy Spirit to be with them. Lord, we just ask you to just touch their hearts right now, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Break up the stony ground of their hearts, Father God, to receive the word that's going to come forth today. Lord, we just ask you to bless everybody here in a serving capacity, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we, where flesh wants to reside, Father God, we just ask you to allow the spirit, the spirit to go forth, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just ask you to whatever we do, Father God, that, that love is what, is what motivates us, Father God, in the name of Jesus. To carry out your word, Father God, in the name of Jesus, what motivates us, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for the musicians, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just ask you to be with them. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to bless the praise, uh, the praise uh, uh, team, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Bless the voices right now, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, let them usher in a, a harmonious worship, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for the worship that's going to go forth, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we know there's no need to uh, ask you to bless the word because it's already blessed. Lord, but I just ask you to anoint the ears of the people that's here and not here, Father God, to hear that word, Father God, in the name of Jesus, and be doers of that word, Father God. Lord, we just thank you for the temple that we uh, that you so graciously bestowed upon us to worship, Lord, and we just thank you for it to be able to freely worship, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just uh, thank you for the people that are not here, Father God, that are watching, Father God, we ask that you touch them, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 And now we come with our scripture reading. And it is coming from Psalms 1, verses 1 through 2. And the word of the Lord read is such. Yes, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Amen. May the Lord have a blessing upon the reading of his word. I now turn it over to the praise team. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. At the cross, hallelujah.
I sent him a text yesterday, and this is just how Deacon Bobby and I talk. I sent him a text, and I said, hey, I said, happy birthday, Tata Deacon. His grandkids call him Tata. And he says, oh, well, I'm over 70. I don't really celebrate birthdays like that. I said, well, we just praise God that you're an OG Vato Loco and you're still here. <laughs> He responded back, hold on a minute, Carnell. That's right. That's, right. that's, that's, that's my brother. <laughs> Deacon Bobby is a big guy, a big guy. I heard, I was in the office and I heard, and I knew it was him when he pulled up, because I heard a, a, a hog outside. And Brother Michael is a friend of mine, and he's been here two weeks in a row now, and he has that Harley that's outside. I bring that up because, amen. I bring that up because if you were at the police forum, you heard me ask Opaly if I could ride the bike. And, uh, trying to convince my wife to let me have one just one day. Amen. I don't want that. I know there's a safety issue, so I'll just park it in the garage and go out there and just wrap it up every once in a while and go back in the house. But, but I do. I, 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 I was watching, uh, I flew around to watch Wild Hogs the other day, and I just, I just fell in love with it again. It's not what I'm like. But it's so good to see you all this morning. Yeah, Sister Wright and Brother Antoine, good to see y'all. Good to see y'all. She's another one that's gifted to sing. That's in the house. And I, I believe that as this thing starts to kind of shift a little bit, then we'll start to have our voices back. Sister Michelle is another one. Sister Latoya is another one. I believe that as this thing starts to shift, our voices will start to come back and we'll be able to do what we do. Um, I, I'm not going to take offense to the Falcons mask this morning. I'll let him slide with that one. But, uh, we're so grateful to see them. Listen, we're, we're, it, it just, it's just fitting that we have a powerful worship this morning. Um, and I know some of the songs that are being introduced, we don't know them, so we're going to do the best we can. We're actually working on a um, visual aid to help put the lyrics of some of the songs on the screen for us because they're older songs from Pentecostal choirs 20, 30 years ago, and they're powerful songs. And so we had a powerful moment in here, and, and Mr. David, I'll say we had a little buck. And um, it just figures that we, this happened, nobody manufactured it. This happened on a weekend where our governor said that the church should take strong consideration. He didn't say ban, but he said strong consideration and not singing and worship. So strong consideration. Now you all know I'm one that complies. I believe in compliance. Do. When they asked us to kind of shut the buildings down and go virtual, we did that for three and a half months. No questions asked. And so I, I, and I understand the purpose. I do. I'm one that believes that this virus is real and it's spreading quickly. Um, the encouraging signs are that the death rates have dropped, even though the infection of us want the virus. Um, that's just what I believe. But when I read the governor's recommendations and considerations, I also saw that he allowed protest. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Y'all know I, I'm not I'm not one to go Republican Democrat. This is just right versus wrong. Right. So you allow protest. And I said, okay, well if I can stand shoulder to shoulder with a thousand other people right. and yell black lives matter, or blue lives matter, or all lives matter, if I can stand shoulder to shoulder with thousands of people and protest the fact that they're shutting down the basketball courts and the gyms and everything else. If I can stand shoulder to shoulder and protest, then surely I can stand in the sanctuary and that's God's house and lift Jesus up. I, I mean, he is the one who saved me. He is the one that guarantees that I have abundant life and life everlasting. So surely if I can get mad about what we what we see on TV, surely I can lift, I, I'm out of, and I just, I just got a little irritated in my spirit because I said, well, that's interesting because uh, in the Bible, the Bible says that if, if they don't cry out, then the rocks will cry out for them. So if worship is your problem, try to shut it up if you want to. The rocks don't cry out in Sacramento. But I refuse to let a rock cry out for me. I'm going to live Jesus everywhere that I go. I'm sorry. And I, I'll, 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 take, I'll take it a step further. Since he inhabits the praises of his people, that, as, as my wife said, if he inhabits the praises of, of his people, then if I want him in my mess, I have to open my mouth. 
And no, let's not get confused about what any of this is really going on. The enemy knows if I can shut the mouth of the church and I can stop the breakthroughs from happening. And some of us, and this is not, I don't, if God told you to close your church or open your church, that's between you and God, that leader of that house, that's between you and him. But for the body of Christ, for the people of God, please see what's at stake here. They're literally telling you that you can protest, but you can't praise. Did y'all did catch that? Right? And as for me in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And so going forward, if we have to call our church service a peaceful protest, that's what we're going to do. So if anybody asks, are y'all still having church? No. We protest in Satan. That's all we're doing. Leave us alone. We protest the devil in this place. That was just, that wasn't even part of the word. I just, I just saw that and I got vexed in my spirit a little bit. I said, hold on, devil. We're not going. You got to be careful what you acquiesce to and what liberties you're willing to lay down just at the drop of a dime. All right? Because, because the, 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 the Constitution protects the right to protest, but it also protects the right to religious freedoms as well. And so at some point, I understand that if we don't want to come in here and congregate, I get that because the virus is real. But you, you may stop me from assembling, but you will not stop me from worshiping. And if we can't worship in here, then we'll find a place in the park. We're going to worship regardless. Anybody waiting on God to do something? All the time. Just waiting on God to do something. I mean, just, I mean, I mean, really waiting, like, like. Lord, can you hurry up? That, that's, that, okay, that's y'all. No, this is me. Right, right, right. Lord, I, let me tell you something. Last night, last night, out of nowhere, I, I had a shortness of breath and I started wheezing. And this doesn't happen to me often anymore. And last night, my wife, uh, she, she was vacuuming and I was preparing the sermon and I'm in my, my, my little man cave room, and suddenly I had a tightness of chest, uh, uh, breath, a tightness in my chest. And I said, oh, here we go, right? Thankfully, we have a breathing machine at the house and all that kind of stuff. And Mother Marion, and some of you all know what I'm talking about, the machine, you put the mask on, you got to go to town. And I put two vials in the thing, and I, you know, sat there and took the breathing treatment. And while I'm taking the treatment, I'm reading scripture, I'm reading this song, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I can just think back of all the times that God said, I'm going to heal your body. Yeah. And asthma will no longer be an issue for you. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, well, can you hurry up? Because it's been, it's, it's, see, y'all, yeah, that's fine. Y'all don't, this is, okay, this is how we talk to them. Okay, Lord, can, can, can you hurry up? And it just, it just doesn't help me because I see, I see that everybody else is getting healed. So people are getting healed of cancer. People are getting healed of, of all kind of, of, of arthritic conditions and all that. And I still have the same old asthma. Lord, can you please hurry up real quick? Now, the question I ask is, is anybody waiting on God to do something? Have you ever waited so long that the weight actually became heavy like a weight? Where it became like a burden on you, right? Where you wait like the weight, weight, W-A-I-T, turn into a W-E-I-G-H-T. And then that, that weight, it became heavy on you because you're pressing your way, you're serving, you're singing, you're worshiping, you're smiling, you're loving, but people don't know the pain behind the smile because they don't understand that you're still waiting on God to do something for you. And so, so now we're at this second wave of what they call COVID. We have all this civil unrest going on. And everyone is mad at something. Can y'all leave the syrup bottles alone, please? Anyways, everybody mad at something, right? Everybody's just frustrated. And the believers are saying, God, you said in your word that you're going to deliver us. And we're sitting here waiting patiently, but now the wait is becoming a wait. Because now while we're waiting, we're being told we may not be able to open up our mouths and worship. Now while we're waiting, we're sitting there wondering if we're going to be safe, if we're going to be able to protect our families, if, if, our, if our institutions of, 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 of religion and church, if they're going to be protected. And we're saying, Lord, can you please just hurry up a little bit? And I know God will see us through, and I know it's not a matter of if but when, but at some point you're like, Lord, can you please pick up the pace a little bit? Isn't it frustrating to see where it looks like the enemy is winning? Right? right. Where it seems like wickedness is being exalted. It seems like the people of God are being put in the corner and we can't, we can't operate. But if you're evil, you've got a green light to go operate as much as you want to do. Isn't, that, isn't it weird? And you're saying, God, I know that you're going to vindicate us because you did it for Moses in Exodus. I know you're going to vindicate us because you did it for Israel. I know you're going to vindicate us because we are your children. We are your people. But Lord, can you please hurry up? Can you move quickly real quick? I'm not losing faith, but I'm getting a little bit tired. And what happens is, if we're not patient in this process, we tend to take matters into our own hands. Yeah. And that's the last thing that we want to do, is take matters into our own hands. 
I can't speak for you all, but I know there's been times where I waited on God to do something and he had to move quick enough, and I lost patience, and I lost trust in him, and I wouldn't try to do it myself. Anybody ever, we, we, we don't even have to talk uh, things that are spiritual. You waiting on God to give you a car because God said somebody's going to bless you a car. And while you're waiting on God to bless you with a car, so at some point you got tired of catching a bus and you went to a car lot and you got yourself a car. And you called it a blessing. We've been there. I think a few of us have been there before only to find out that you're going to end up paying more for that car than you should have. Yeah, my, my wife and I, we were waiting on God to give us a baby. God said, I'm going to give you a child. And we got tired of waiting. We got tired of waiting. We were worshiping. We we're serving. We're waiting on everybody. We're just waiting on God to give us this beautiful child. And it took too long. And we saw everybody else getting pregnant around us. People that didn't want to get pregnant. Literally, a couple was sitting at our living room table said, we don't want no more kids. And three weeks later, y'all, I'm pregnant. We said, what's going on here? So we decided to take matters into our own hands. We tried to go adopt and do all that kind of stuff that was outside of the will of God for our life. What I'm telling you is that sometimes the weight becomes so long and heavy that if you're not careful, you'll start to put matters into your own hands. Right. Yeah. Center got me a few times. Yeah. Not wanting to wait on God. Yeah. Paid for a flat screen for eight years. That's just like, right, right, right. Because at some point, at some point, you like, man, I'm gonna give this TV back. Do you realize I done paid six years? I'm like, going around. Y'all know, yeah, I'm like, right, right. I'm glad I'm not the only one that got got. Rent a center truck drive by me now. I highlight this to share. So I don't want no sweat, right? Psalm chapter thirteen. Psalm thirteen. Very short psalm. It's a psalm. David says, oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? He says, turn it into me, oh Lord. Restore the sparkle to my eyes or I will die. Don't let my enemies gloat, saying we have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice in my downfall. But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. Yes. David asks the question, he says, Lord, how long? And I believe some of us are here right now. Lord, how long do I have to wait? And I think at one point in time, we've all asked that question. How long, how long do I have to keep praying? How long do I have to keep fasting? How long do I have to keep smiling when I want to choke somebody? How long, Lord, how long, how long? And I'm sure we've all felt neglected by God in a sense because it's like God has taken too long. And I want to encourage you this morning that when God seems distant, he has not forgot about you. All right? We, we got to understand, sometimes you got to encourage yourself and look, just look at yourself in the mirror every day and say, God has not forgotten about me. Even though the promise has not come to fruition, even though it hasn't manifest yet, God has not forgotten about me. And David, in this song, he asked the question, how long? Four times. Four times ago, how long, how long, how long? It was a very intense desire for him to be delivered, and he was anguished. He had anxiety and anguish in his heart. And I love the way Charles Spurgeon said it. He says, it's not easy to prevent desire from degenerating into impatience. Charles Spurgeon said, look, it's not, it, it, it's really natural. It can happen where your desire becomes so strong, it develops into you being impatient. Right? We talked about that, right? We're waiting on God to do something and we get impatient and we take matters, what, into our own hands. And so, and so, and so Spurgeon goes on to say that if we're not careful, we'll develop a murmuring spirit. Y'all know what a murmuring spirit is? In Numbers chapter 13 and 14, you remember where Moses, when, when he sent the spies out to the land, and the 12 spies went out, and 10 came back and said, we can't have that land, it's too big, the giants are too big, it's too dangerous there, and two spies, Joshua and Caleb came back and said, no, if God said we can have it, we're well able, we're going after it, but after that, people started to murmur. Murmur meant gossip. Murmur meant say bad things. Say things against the will of God. And what Spurgeon was saying was, look, if you're not careful, your, your desire will turn to impatience, and then you'll start to talk negatively about your faith and your walk with God. What does that look like? Man, that preacher lied to me. God didn't say that. What does that look like? That happened in the old days. It can't happen for anybody now. Anybody ever been there, right? Right. And so this is this is what happens. And so David starts asking that question: How long? How long? And oftentimes we faint. We give up just because the trial is simply too long. We feel we can handle anything if we just knew when it was going to end. And so for me, 
as a leader in the church. In March 15, 2020, I asked God, okay, we can shut down the services, but for how long? Y'all ever? Okay. March 29th came, all right, God, we're two weeks in. How long? Yeah, yeah. April 15th, by that point, I'm no longer smiling. You can actually see the distress on my face because I just want to see some people. And April 15th, okay, God, how long? Then we can all wait in May. And so the impatience turned into me wanting to take matters into my own hands. Called out a Franklin, called out a Tinker. I said, all right, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> if I can't tell her nobody, I'll tell her myself. So I said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to Kmart in the parking lot, and we're going to have a service. Right there. That's what we're going to do. Yeah? It's outside. Can't nobody put no restrictions on it. We take issues down or all that kind of stuff. And got impatient. Didn't I, didn't I be called? Did we talk about that? And I said, that's what we're going to do. Two weeks later, Kmart closed down because somebody bought the building. That's right. And they didn't just shut it down. They shut the parking lot off. You can't even go through there. <laughs> and God has said, I'm telling you to be patient. I need us to understand, during this process, God has a lesson for all of us individually on patience. God is trying to build our resolve and build our trust in him. Paul said in Corinthians, he says three times, I asked God to remove this thorn from my flesh and God said, no, I'm not gonna remove it because my grace is sufficient for you. Yeah. What Paul taught us was when I came to the end of myself, that's really when I found the beginning of God. And, and some of us can never feel the presence of God because we're so full of ourselves at the moment. Right. And God is saying, I'm not asking you to be full of yourself. I'm asking you to come to the end of yourself so you can come to the beginning of me. Do you realize that God said, I'm a jealous God? Yes. You shall serve no other master before me. What he was saying was, I'm not going to allow you to worship yourself and me at the same time. Right. Ain't that something? That's right. And so at some point, you have to come to the end of yourself and say, okay, nevertheless, not my will, God will. Be done. We are not alone. God has not forgotten us. In, in, in Jeremiah, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in Isaiah 49, Isaiah 49, he told Jerusalem, verse 14, this is God speaking to Jerusalem, and, and I believe that he's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore, which means that he's saying the same thing to us right now. Isaiah 49, verse 14, the Lord has deserted us, the Lord has forgotten us. Then here's the response. The prophet says, never can a mother forget her nursing child. Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, I would not forget you. I have written your name on the palms of my hands. He says, look, even if it was possible for a mother to forget the child that she nursed to help, I would never be able to forget you. Right. He knows the hairs that are on our head. Yes, sir. He knows our thoughts before we think them. He knows, he knows what we're going to do before we do it, and yet he loves us enough to keep us in the palm of his hand, which lets me know that there's no way that he's forgotten about us. Ain't that something? Amen. And so David takes us through this song. And if I ever, I don't really title messages, but I think this one we can title, From Torment to Triumph. From Torment to Triumph. Torment to Triumph. Bishop T.D. Jake said something on a television broadcast one day. He says, people see my glory, but they don't know my story. Okay. And nobody ever really... Yeah, okay, fine. He didn't always have a big church. Now he had a big church. It wasn't until they released the pictures of him being as a pastor in South Carolina or Atlanta, wherever he was. And South Carolina, right. And he didn't look as polished as he looks now. That's right. His, his wife didn't look as well put together as she looked now. When they showed a picture of the car that they drove, that car didn't look like what they would drive right now. And so what he was saying is, you know the glory. You see me standing on this platform with 10,000 members and 15,000 members, but you really don't know my story. Yes, I look triumphant now, but before I got to this triumphant stage, I had to go through some torment. The problem with the church is we just want to win. We don't ever want to take any losses. We just want to win. We don't ever really want to struggle. But Paul told the church in Philippi, he says, look, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. He says, I want to share in his suffering. Do you know what sharing in suffering means? What that means is the, 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 the grueling process that put Christ on the cross. I want a piece of that. How many of us, really, really, I mean, I, I, we can be real with ourselves. How many of us are really, 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 really comfortable in suffering? How many of us look at suffering as this is a chance for me to get closer to Christ? Or do we look at suffering as this is God just picking on me? We give the devil so much credit. Ooh, the devil's busy. Because you keep employing him. 
Because if we realize Genesis 50, 20, J Joseph said, what the enemy meant for bad, God flipped for my good. So when things start going crazy in life, I refuse to give the devil any credit. I posted something on Facebook the other night. I'm not asking, I'm not asking anything about why the devil is attacking. I'm asking why God is trying to show me. What is he trying to show me in the midst of all of this? Instead of saying, okay, the devil is busy, he keeps attacking me, he's attacking my finances, he's attacking this. I'm asking God, why is it that he's allowed to attack this? Where am I vulnerable? Because I can tell you now, being, let me tell you a quick story. I used to box. I used to box. I, I, well, I tried to box, right? I tried to box. Oh, Lord. I found out that boxing wasn't the same as fighting. Yeah. No, no, really, really, really. When I was growing, when I was growing up and out through college, I was known to I would throw hands in a minute, and I thought that because I could throw hands on the street, that I surely could do it in the, in the ring. I just knew I could. Nobody told me. <laughs> no, I wasn't ready. Nobody told me. And so my friend Lewis and I, he might be watching. Lewis, if you're watching, I'm telling on both of us. My friend Lewis and I, Lewis is a big boxing fan. He says, hey, there's a gym in Cathedral City, a boxing gym. It's only $25 for the year. We can get in and we can train. I said, oh, okay, let's go. Let's go. So we get to the boxing gym. I walk in, and the dude, the owner, he sees me. And he says, oh, your name is Kimbo. Back then, Kimbo Slice was the biggest, right? Right. He said, you big black guy, you Kimbo. You go get in the ring, you go fight. And I said, okay. So they start us with drills, right? Punch and bag. And when you, when you warm up, you have to do three minutes on each section, right? So it starts with the punch and bag. You got to hit the bag. Then the bell rings. You go to shadow box. You go to shadow box. box yourself. Bell rings. You go to the speed bag. And so he's watching me. He, he's like, oh, yeah. He says, you know what? There's an amateur competition coming up at Agua Caliente. He said, I want you to get in it. You can win it. I said, well, I'm sure I can. I got hands. <laughs> oh. This was, this was, just, was it five years ago? This was just five years ago. They wasn't that long ago, right? I said, sure, I can win. I, 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 this is what I do. He says, okay, so all this time this week I'm training because I think that I'm going to go from one week of boxing training into an amateur tournament, just like that. So the tournament's on Saturday. Thursday, he says, big man, Kimbo, you got a spar. I said, okay. He said, I need to get you a sparring partner. He's looking around the gym, and he gets somebody that's about half my size. He says, you gonna spar with him. I said, <laughs> 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 I'm gonna knock him in the next week, boy. That's what I'm gonna do, boy. So we get in the ring, they put my gloves on, they take me up real good. I'm in the corner. He says, when the bell rings, y'all touch gloves, go back to your corner, come back and fight. All right, cool. Let's come back and fight. Y'all got in the middle ring, and he started bouncing. Now I'm like, we don't do all that. We just, you know. <laughs> I ain't, I ain't I'm just going to throw it. But while he was bouncing, the ring was bouncing. And so after 45 seconds of him bouncing and making the ring bounce, my legs got weak. Because you're doing this the whole time, right? And so from my corner, he says, Kimbo, throw a punch. I threw a punch. I had nothing behind it. He took it and smiled at me. I said, oh, he, he's real. Okay. So we in the middle, we're just kind of going at it. And he fires off one and hits me right here. I'll never forget it. I think I said my social security number. I said something. I didn't even know. Hold on, what I said, but I said something. And he, I mean, he just, and I was like, you know, I got, and you know, you know, I'm trying, okay, because, you know, I don't want to make it seem like I got hurt, so I'm trying to, you know, trying to act like it didn't hurt. I'm like, okay, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I'm like doing all this, right? So we go back to the corner, and he says, okay, that's enough for today. He says, you're not ready to fight Saturday. I said, you think? He said, well, look, here's the problem. He said, he said, the problem is, it's not that you're not capable. He says that you're not recognizing where you're getting hit. I said, what do you mean? He said, he hit you three times in the same spot. Right. He said, common sense should have told you if, my, if the right side of my mouth is open, I need to cover the right side of my mouth. Right? Right? But, so, but, but because I was in the midst of the action, I was taking hits, I didn't even think to cover myself. I was too busy trying to fight myself. And this is what's happening with the devil. He's hitting us in the same place every time, and instead of covering where he's hitting, we're trying to fight. And so we give the devil way too much credit. Because at the end of the day, it's not that he is attacking you. He's supposed to attack you. He, that is his job. But Job lets us know that he can only attack what God allows. Right. So the question is not, why is a devil attacking me? The question is, why is God allowing this to happen in my life? Right. From torment to triumph. Right. David asked four times, how long will you forget me? 
How long will you turn your back on me? How long will you make it seem like you're no longer there? I told you that God has not forgotten about you. He's allowing this situation, the situation that we're in. And I believe right now, this is the first time in my lifetime that everybody's going through something. I've never seen it like this before. Sometimes you have the Hatfields and the McCoys. Sometimes you have the haves and the have-nots. But for the first time in my 42, almost 42 years, everybody I know, everybody across the globe is going through something. If it's not financial, it's health. If it's not health, it's, it's, it's job. If it's not job, it's just COVID. Everybody going through something. But David said in Psalm 27, 13, I would have fainted. I would have thrown the towel. Unless I believe that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He said, I would have gave up a long time ago. He said, the only thing that kept me alive was the fact that I knew that I was going to see the Lord show up on my behalf while I was yet alive. He said, so then I want you to wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. Wait on the Lord. Now notice, David said he will strengthen your heart. He didn't say he'll bring you out. Right. Because some trials are just going to be here for a minute. If you don't believe me, ask the woman with the issue of blood. She bled for 12 long years. And some trials have an expiration date beyond our understanding. So there may come a time where God has you in a trial that you can't pray off. There may come a time where God has us in a trial where we can't worship off. There may come a time where God has us in a trial where a good buck and praise around the church ain't going to change a thing. That's right. Come on. And so David said, if you just wait on him, he'll strengthen your heart so you can endure the trial. Galatians 6 and 9, it says, don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. What the scripture is saying is, don't get tired in doing the right thing, because at the right time, you will reap a harvest if you just don't throw in the towel. What if I told you that the enemy wants you to throw in the towel because he knows if I can convince you to quit, then I can convince you to walk away from your trials. Ain't that something? Yeah. Problem is, we move in hours, in minutes, and God slides through eternity. So we think that because I've been at this thing for three days, it's been long enough. And God is saying three days is nothing but a second to me. You're going to be all right, baby. First Peter, 2 Peter 3 and 8, you must forget this one thing. Don't forget this one thing. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. Yes. Here's this. Regardless of where you are right now, you need to raise your expectations as to who God is. Yes. Regardless of, and I'm serious, Jesus said it in Matthew, he said it in Mark, Matthew 19, 26, he says, look, he says, things are impossible with man, but with God, all things are possible. So regardless of where you are in life right now, you need to raise your expectation in God. Check this out. And I saw a quote yesterday and it really blew my mind. If you expect nothing from God, you're going to get it. Number one, if you expect nothing from God, that's exactly what you're going to get. Sometimes our, our, our drought, sometimes our period of transition, sometimes our process, our life in the wilderness, sometimes it has nothing to do with sin. You remember in John chapter 9 when they brought the man that was blind. They said, Jesus, who sinned to make this man blind for birth? He said, did nobody sin. This happened to him so I can get the glory. So sometimes it has nothing to do with sin, but sometimes it has everything to do with your faith. That's right. Yes. Jesus passed through the crowd. And he couldn't heal anybody. Not that he didn't have all power in his hand. He couldn't heal anybody because they had no belief. Yeah. Ain't that something? Yes, sir. So while you're in this torment stage, what do you believe? In the middle of your torment, <laughs> you may not be delivered. Right. But you, all you need is a touch. Yes. Yeah. The, the first stage of David's prayer was torment. He said, Lord, I'm tormented. And then he realized all this praying and nothing's changing. So God, I just need you to give me a touch real quick. See, this is where this is where, 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 where I, I saw a testimony about a man who had COVID and he was in the hospital on a ventilator and they got ready to put him. They put him in a coma for four days and he came out of the coma and he still wasn't breathing well. And he said, okay, I know that I know God. I'm praying and I'm asking people to leave worship music going in the room and all that kind of stuff. He says, but my condition's not changing. And they said, well, what happened? He said, I just asked the Lord to touch me. Watch, watch, okay. David, verse four, Psalm 13. Turn and answer me, O Lord my God. Restore the sparkle in my eyes or I will die. That touch is a restoration. You're saying, Lord, I, life is so dark right now. I just need you to touch me. Yeah. Have you ever been in a situation yeah. when your body has been racked in pain and, you've, and really you've taken all the medication you can take and you've seen all the doctors you can see and nothing's changing and then God just touches you and your body's still in pain, but you, you see some hope. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Oh, be. 
Yeah. We ain't gonna talk about the body. Yeah, this, this is this is just me. This last three and a half months, I, I think I've had um, I was gonna call it what it is. I've had bouts of depression. And I don't know that, that, that many preachers will admit to people they've had bouts of depression. Because we like to we like to portray like we just got it all. Right. I ain't got it all. I mean, honestly, some days I ain't got it. Some days it's a struggle just to have it. Y'all not hear what I'm saying. And so I've had battles of depression the last three and a half months. I'm talking about, I'm talking about not wanting to get out of the bed depression. I'm talking about wanting just to keep the covers over your head depression. Anybody? Yeah, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm talking about don't ask me to pray for you because I need you to pray for me. I'm talking about that kind of depression. I'm talking about don't, don't, yeah, I'm talking about that kind of pressure right there. Don't call me for a prayer. I need you to lay hands and pray for me. I need you to call out my name in prayer. I need you. And I'm talking about don't, don't, don't look for me to check on you. I need you to check on me. That kind of depression. The last three and a half months. And every time I came to the church, I had to ask God to give me a touch to restore the light in my eyes. Because why? The last thing I needed was for a congregation full of people to come here and see me defeated. Now, the situation never changed, but he touched them. So I would have to look like what I was going through. Some of us sit in church every Sunday with cancer running through our body. We don't look nothing like we're going through because why? He touched us. Some of us are sitting in church every, every Sunday, going to work every week. Our mind is going crazy. We might even have a suicidal thought, but we don't look like what we're going through because he touched us. Some of us right now sit in front of our kids every night with no money in the bank, with no food in the cabinet, but we don't show them what we're going through. Why? Because he touches us. And I'm here to tell you, if the situation does not change, all you need is a touch to give you the strength to get through it. Yeah. Psalm 116 and 1 says, I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. Thank you, God, you hear my voice, you hear my prayer. Mr. Governor, that's why I won't stop worshiping, because he hears my voice. But check out the very next verse. He hears my voice, and verse 2 says, he bends down to listen. Y'all don't know the power of that. My, my, my nephew, Elijah, you can see pictures of him from the last three years on Facebook Memories. Ever since he was two, he's five now. Ever since he was two, we were on a trailer, he would run up and just grab my leg. Oh, Shelly, grabs your leg. I don't know what it is about him grabbing legs. But he just, he grabs legs and he holds on for dear life and you just gotta like, boy, come on, let's go. And then when he feels like you're moving too quick, he'll kind of wrestle you so you won't go anywhere. And then for the longest time, I, I would tell him, I said, boy, yep, yep, this boy, oh, something wrong, I don't know what's going on with him, something weird about this boy right now. And I found out, we were on a struggle one day, and he just grabbed my leg, and I found out, I said, I looked, I said, boy, what do you want? Uncle, you got a dog? That's, that's it, right? We're laughing. But he messed with me long enough until I bent down to see what he wanted. Right. Right. The psalmist said, I love the Lord because he hears my cry. Yeah. He said, and when he hears my voice, I bug him enough to where he has to bend down and hear what I need. And at that moment, he'll give me a touch. This is why I told you, there's no way I'm going to shut my mouth because I need God too much in this pandemic. Yeah. So if I got to call him with a mask on, I'm going to call him with a mask on, but I'm still going to call him if I got to call him. I'm going to call him anyway. And so David, David, David said, I need a touch. He said, I'm in torment, I need a touch. And then finally, I'm just going to trust you. Yeah, I'm just going to trust you. Yes. Some trust them chariots. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My trust is in him. Yes. I will look to the hills from which come with my help. Yes. My help comes from the Lord. The Lord. Yes. Sister, yes. Michelle, Sister Michelle said, look to the hills, we just going to be some hillbillies. That's what we're going to do. We're going to the hills from the come with our help. We're just going to trust in the Lord. Yeah. I love Brother Sarge, but I can't put my trust in Brother Sarge. Right. 
because Brother Sarge can't deliver me from anything. He can pray with me, he can call on me, he can check on me. Brother Sarge can't deliver me. I love my wife with all my heart, but I can't put my trust in her because she's a human being just like I'm a human being, which means that she's prone to mistake and issue just like I'm prone to mistake and issue. Y'all can love me all day long, but don't you put your trust in me because I'm a human being just like you are a human being. Don't let the collar fool you. Yes, I am called of God, I'm anointed of God, but when the oil is on me, I'm still a man. And so I'm going to put my trust in the Lord. Why can't I put my trust in my bishop? Because then if you put your trust in your bishop, at one moment in life, you may see him as a human being, and you may see him in all his humanity, and you may see him in a, in a flawed state, which will cause you to lose faith in who God really is. So now, when you see your bishop, reference who he is, but keep your eyes on the cross, because only trust in God will get you anywhere. And so David said, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to trust you. He said, I'm going to trust you. I trust you because I trust your unfailing love. I'm going to read this to you from Paul in Romans chapter 8. We're just about through. And the other tinkers going to get communion prepared and we're going to go forward. Uh, Paul in Romans chapter 8. Can anything, verse 35, ever separate us from the love of God? Does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? are persecuted, are hungry, are destitute and threatened with death. Verse 38, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. Verse 39, no power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed, can separate us from the love of God. There is not a pandemic that can celebrate separate us from God's love. There's not a dark time in our nation's history that can separate us from the love of God. There's not enough civil unrest in the world that can separate us from the love of God. But if you go back up in verse 37, I skipped it intentionally. He says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who lives in us. What Paul said is, if Jesus was able to go to the, go to the cross and go to the grave and defeat death, hell, and the grave, and he's alive today, trust me, you're able to defeat what you're in right now. But you're going to have to be willing to go through the torment and ask for a touch and then, and then lean on his trust. Why? Why do I need to trust him? Because after he touches me, the condition may not change. My outlook will change. My spirit may be lifted, but I still might have cancer. Yep. Yep. Yes, sir. The outlook may change. My spirit may be lifted, but I still may have to come to church next week and everybody not here. The outlook may change. My spirit may be lifted once he touches me, but I still may not have the money I need to do what I want to do. So that means that I'm just going to have to trust him. If, I, if, I, if he can touch me and change my disposition, I need to trust him to know that he'll deliver me out of this thing. Here's the last part. And this is, this is, this is, this is, for, um, this is for the people who don't understand, who think it's just okay to stop your worship and shut your mouth. This is for the people. Verse 6, chapter 13, he says, I will sing to the Lord because he's good to me. I will sing to the Lord because he's good to me. Mind you, David, situation had not changed at all. He's still in the middle of his pandemic. He's still dealing with torment after he got his touch. But he says, I will sing to the Lord because he's good to me. What I love about worship is, no matter what I'm dealing with, when I start to worship, I automatically enter his presence. Yes. Yes. What I love about praise is, no matter what I'm dealing with, no matter what I'm facing, the moment I open my mouth and declare the Lion of Judah is real, the enemy has to flee. What I love about praise and worship is, no matter how much I'm bound and locked up, once I start to worship, chains start to fall and doors start to open. What I love about praise is, regardless of how crazy life can get, if I can just muster up enough strength to sing the name of Jesus, something has to change. This is why we will not close our mouth. This is why we will not stop worshiping. This is why we can't stop praising. This is why we can't stop lifting him up. He said that if I can lift it up, I'll drop all men to me. And so as you prepare to leave here today, I dare you to put a spirit of worship on your mind. Not just for when you leave here, but for when you get in your car and when you get home and when people ask, what did the governor say? You just start singing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What does the owner say? What can wash away? What? Why? Because I refuse to allow anybody to 
stop me from worshiping my God. You don't know what God know. What he's done for me. You can't tell it like I can. Where he, what he brought me out of. You, 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 you don't know. You, you don't know the story how he found me in the middle of a mess when everybody else thought I was just this good boy. You don't know. You, you have no idea how he restored me when everybody else thought that I didn't need restoration. You have no idea how he kept me when I wanted to take my life. You have no idea how he kept my marriage together when I wanted to walk away. You have no idea how he kept me in this pulpit when I wanted to throw in the towel. And he's been that good to me, and you want me to shut up because of a virus? Yeah. Mr. 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 Governor, I, I, I present to you this case. Yeah. That COVID's not going away because of a vaccine. Come on. Come on. COVID's not going away because of a doctor named Fauci. Mm. The only way COVID's going away is the name above all names. Yeah. <laughs> So if you truly want the, the nation to be healed of COVID, if my people were called on my name. Individually and collectively. Sometimes life happens outside and it gets so overbearing to where you bring it into home as well. And so we've had a week of all weeks. But I praise God because he's good to us. He's good to us because he didn't slow us and take us out when we were acting a fool with each other. He's, yeah, that's just that's just that's just the truth. Y'all better quit taking advantage of grace and thinking that thinking that he just loves us so much he's not gonna get y'all better. Stop that. Right? He's good to us because he gave us another day, new mercies on Sunday morning to get it right and get it together. Never take advantage of the new mercies that you're given every morning. If you need reason to pay attention, look at the death toll in the country, not just from COVID, but from everything. There are literally hundreds of thousands of people who don't open their eyes every morning. But he lets you open yours. And then when you open your eyes, he breathed the breath of life into your body. And when he breathed the breath of life into your body, the blood was flowing in your veins. And you were able to get up and move and walk around and do what it. And then these are the things we don't need to take for granted. And this is why David said, I will praise God because he's good to me. Not because my situation has changed, but because I'm alive. And as long as I have breath in my body, there's a chance for God to show up and show out in my life. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, whatever it is you're waiting on God to do, please understand. Amen. That's it. You better praise the Lord. Please. <laughs> he said, I'm waiting on God to do something. Yes. Whatever it is you're waiting on God to do, please understand. I don't care how dark it looks. The fact that you're breathing means that there's a time for that thing to turn around. That's right. So I'm going to leave here today encouraged. I looked at my breathing machine this morning. I said, we'll put you away when I get home. Right. I'll put you away, I'm going to wrap it up and put it back in the cabin from whence it came. Because I just believe that God is going to do something today. As we prepare to take the Eucharist, I'm speaking directly to those of us that have sickness in our body right now. If you read the scripture and meditate on what Elder Tinker is about to read, Paul lets us know that the bread and the blood actually can provide healing to our bodies. Amen. That this is just the truth. It's in the word. And as you take communion, I dare you to shift it from a ritual and put some expectation on it. Shift it from its first Sunday that we're going to do this to put some expectation on it. Sister Courtney, I saw you walk in gingerly. As you take communion, I dare you to put some expectation on it and ask God to touch your body as you consume the bread and the juice. Whoever else is in here, I'm going to do it myself. Because even now, I can feel my lungs trying to, you know, do what they want to do. But I just, I just believe. I just believe. I just believe. For everyone else that's taking, that's taking communion, please do this knowing that you're doing it because you believe in the work and the atoning work of Christ on the cross. 
I'm taking her to the Chicago.
God and said, Take, eat, this is my body, this is your for you, do this in remembrance of me. touch her right where she stands right now in the name of Jesus. God, we believe a touch is all she needs from you. A touch to remind her that you are God. A touch to remind her that you are able. And God, even while her body is being healed, God, start to touch her mind right now. We plead the blood of Jesus over her body, over her mind, God, and we speak peace to her mind while she waits for that healing. God, as she walks out of this place, she's walking in trust. And as your word says, as they went, they were healed. So, God, as she goes, we speak healing over her body. We speak peace to her mind right now in the name of Jesus. And, God, we thank you because by faith she participated in the Eucharist. So, by faith, her body shall be healed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you all. See you Wednesday night.